David McCraney, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I am thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. I'm thrilled to be in this conversation. Let's talk about stuff. <laughs> David, we will talk about stuff because I have for more than 10 years uh, been in love with the content you produce, your writing, your podcast. I still remember listening to um, You Are Not So Smart. The first time I heard it, it was mostly from curiosity. You were you had annoyed me, that title. Like you are not, what, who the heck are you to be telling me I'm not so smart? And then I fell in love with uh, both your approach and your own humility in doing the podcast. But before we get to that and your outstanding book, How Minds Change, The Surprising Science of Belief, Opinion, and Persuasion, would love to know whereabouts you grew up and how your upbringing impacted the kind of person you become. Oh, yeah. You know, back in the day, like especially like 10 years ago, when the first book came out, the podcast, I was very hesitant to share this part of my life. I just wanted people to think I was from the internet or something. <laughs> and uh, I was very careful about uh, not letting my eyes get too long, lack, rat, mat, fat. Um I still have problems with words like want. I want to go won't. So uh, I, I in a previous era, I would have joined the circus or ran, ran away from home or something. I would have uh, certainly uh, found a way out sooner than I did. But thankfully, I was just in that cusp of millennial Gen X where I, the internet came along and I was able to find all the weirdos and the others, as they say, um, through that and had some nice people who were like, Hey, check out this, check out that. So I grew up in Mississippi. Um, and my family is all still in Mississippi. And I grew up in a very, very red state, but also very fundamentalist, uh, region of that area. And I, the, in the book, I talk about like, as the LGBT issues were, uh, shifting in the United States, like I remember as a young man as a, a child you know intensely anti-lgbt acute attitudes where i was at i went i talk in the book how i witnessed uh my uncle uh, who is a gay man who uh opened a flower shop my first job was delivering flowers for that flower shop um he was being bullied and harassed and um i remember my father just he called my father and we went there and my dad roughed up the landlord who was bullying him but it was very well understood that we were not to share that with anyone ever uh for fear of what would happen to my uncle and at the same time there was a lot of uh you know, anti-evolution anti uh science all sorts of stuff and when i finally um worked my way up through college and got out as in was doing um work as a journalist in newspapers and then for tv i write in the book about how uh, you are not so smart. Didn't exactly start this way, but it certainly was part of the incept incepting moment. Was I did a we had a a, a a meteorologist talk about climate change on the air, and I was running the social media. This was back when social media was very new, and they wanted us to. I was part of the team that was trying to uh, make sure every comment on Facebook was okay. Um, you can imagine the nightmare that that might it might be, especially today, <laughs> um, and. I was doing this sort of fact check whack-a-mole as people were like, I can't believe you've let the, um, the weather man now, now I can't even watch the weather. You got to, you're on the, the, the agenda and all that stuff. So I was doing this fact checking and sharing links and everything. And one of our news crew went out, uh, our news crew was out there in the van that you know, that it's the news and someone approached the van and said, Hey, who runs your Facebook page? And they told them, and they said, is he at the station right now? And I said, yeah. He said, thank you. And he left. And then they called me on my desk phone. And they I remember the phone call. They were like, hey, uh, I think we really messed up. I was like, what oh, do you wow. mean? And they said, I think somebody's headed your way. And sure enough, they did. They came. They went into the, uh, they, they, they went to the, they were in the receptionist area trying to get into the building, trying to get back there where we worked. We had to call out law enforcement and, uh, at the station of their patrols it was uh that was one of the first things that clued me into there was something going on with misinformation and 
uh, tribalism and people's reaction to being corrected and all those things. So all of that stuff together, along with a lot of other things from my upbringing, uh, slowly led me to want to get involved in a journalistic way. Plus, I went to school for, for psychology, and I had all this psychology knowledge, at least well, the kind of psychology knowledge you get before you switch majors, that isn't always popular on road trips and parties because you're, people are saying here's this and there's that. I'm like, well, actually that's just called the rule of large numbers or uh, no, that's called pareidolia actually. You know, the kind of things where people are like, Ugh, why do you have to ruin everything? So I tried to find an outlet for it and you are not so smart ended up being that thing. <laughs> hey, David, a uh, lot of other people going through the experiences you went through would have uh, resorted to anger, resentment and more pushback. What in you got you to become even more curious? One of the things that I find fascinating with a lot of the work that you've done is your curiosity. Where does hmm. that come from? I think um, I have always had, I don't know how innate this is or how, how, how nature nurture this is, but I've always had this sort of alien sociologist feeling like I wanted to understand why the people around me where like it seems so evident to me that it was like when I was like, really young, I um I was in Bible school and uh vacation Bible school. Every you you constantly there's somebody there reading these stories to you out of these like coloring book styled stories. And one of them was about the Noah's Ark. And I remember very plainly the um the the woman who was showing us the stuff and telling us about it, she was talking about Noah's Ark and I was looking at a picture and I remember asking, Hey, how come the animals didn't eat each other? And I was, I was like a little kid and I was not like questioning the faith. I wasn't questioning anything. I just thought, Hey, how come it doesn't, there's no details here. It seems like it's a logistics problem. And I had, uh, my father had a lot of old sci-fi books. He kept in a liquor cabinet. I read them you know, that was, I had already had that in my mind. I was an only child. So I was only a child in a trailer in the woods. I was very isolated at a very, uh, hermitage leaves of grass, uh, upbringing, not a lot of, in an isolated area as an only child, I was basically, you know, I was living in the cabin in the woods lifestyle that people uh, think they're going to go do one day. I just started out that way. So and my mom was a big, uh, romance novel reader. So I had books around me of that kind, lots of them pulp books, and that was my portal into the adult world, the outside world. Luckily, I also had PBS, so I had a lot of uh, Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. And there was this intense curiosity about what's going on out there. At the same time, are there clues in these books as to why I do not feel the same as I do as the people around me? And that moment about the Noah's Ark was a big one because I remember my father is a Vietnam veteran. He didn't go to church, but my mother did he didn't go to church for all sorts of PTSD reasons. And, and he was very fearful of, or, or not trusting of, uh, certain types of authority. I, she told me when I asked that question, she said, Oh, we don't ask those questions. And I just felt embarrassed. I didn't feel angry. I just felt embarrassed that I'd been made to look foolish. And so I went home and I told my dad, Hey, this is what happened. And he said, Hey, if you don't want to go back there, you don't have to go back there anymore. And I was like, oh, great. Now I don't have to waste my time there. I can do other stuff. And that probably took me off of a certain path that took me off of a certain kind of cultural uh, shaping. But the curiosity thing has just always been there. I just, I have always wanted to very specifically with the, the, our inner lives, how we make sense of things, subjective reality versus objective reality. It's just always been an intense fascination from storytelling first of all and then that's sort of and I've, I've spoken to other people who had similar childhoods as mine and they often talk about how if you had sci-fi books as a kid it was it was really a way into thinking differently about things because sci-fi books often explore social issues they often explore the idea of subjective reality versus objective reality and all that and then you walk out into the the world around you if you're in south mississippi and nobody cares and nobody's talking about that stuff and I needed it. So that, I think that was a part of that. If I was trying to self-analyze, uh, be my own therapist, that had something to do with it. Uh, I recently spent time with uh, Britt Frank, who was an incredible therapist. And she suggested, she'd seen this in other, so many of her clients that um, children in certain similar situations develop a propensity to uh, 
to disassociate and enter fantasy worlds. And I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. So <laughs> I'm sure all of that boil go, goes into something. Um, also, when I did go to school for the finally was in like uh, my early university classes, um, I had a great psychology professor, Jean Edwards, and she just she brought all the goods because she had been a practicing psychologist for many years before she was a professor. And I just could not get enough. Everything that she introduced, I was like, this is it. This is, this is it's philosophy, but quantified this philosophy tested. And that excited me to no end. Yeah. You, you know, David, that uh, questioning that you had and you have nurtured is one of those things that because of tribal identities, when I associate with and interact with people in one tribe versus another, everyone thinks that they question, the other <laughs> tribe doesn't question. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting in all of the tribes we end up in, there are rules and assumptions that if questioned, we are pushed out of the tribe. Yeah. And one of the one of the things you keep emphasizing is just that fact, how important for us it is that belonging trumps accuracy in all cases. All cases. Like we are motivated reasoners. If you're not familiar with that term, I'm sure you may have heard it in the past, anyone listening, but I think a lot of these things, whether it's cognitive dissonance or motivated reasoning or uh, the confirmation bias, they often have these sort of folk definitions that have made their way to to the surface of public consciousness that are have gotten kind of off of what the actual phenomenon is in psychology with motivated reasoning the easiest way to describe this and I've I've developed this over the last few weeks I really like this framing which is when someone's falling in love with someone and you ask them why so what you what you're doing right when you ask somebody why you're what you're asking for them to do is produce your reasoning for me. And if you want to boil it down even further, you're asking them produce justifiable, plausible reasons for the thing that you have just stated, this emotional state or whatever. So, okay, you, you love this person. You're falling in love with somebody. Why? Oh, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they cut their food, the music they've introduced me to, the movies that we watch together. Now, when that same person is breaking up with that same person and you ask them, why are you breaking up with them? They will say often, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they cut their food, the the, the awful music they 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 make me listen to, the dumb movies we have to watch. So reasons for become reasons against when the motivation to cherry pick from all the evidence available changes. So the motivation has changed, but the the conclusions seem different. You know the the reasons that are become for that were are the reasons that were previously for become reasons against. But it's not always apparent to the person who's experiencing all of that how obvious that is, um, thanks to a couple of things like the introspection illusion and naive realism and all these other things that I've talked about over the years. The All reasoning is motivated. There is always a drive, a motivation, a desire. There's always an end goal, even if it's not apparent to you, even if you have, that isn't salient or articulated. And in pursuit of that, we'll often cherry pick evidence to provide justifications, rationalizations, and in some cases, just conclusions. And when you meet other people across any kind of disagreement line, we often just dump the justifications on each other and, and assume the other side will just go, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> because the the reasoning chain that we went through, that that slog through trying to find something justifiable is kind of invisible at the, to us at the, at the moment that we're, that we're tasked. And it's also invisible for the other side. So this seems like you're going to just, it, it feels like if I just show them the stuff, they should think what I think, but my, that, that isn't, that totally eliminates giving them an opportunity to reason the way you did. So all that being true, the highest motivation, the strongest motivation, the motivation that drives our behavior more than any other, the one that, that we will sacrifice our life to seek that motivated is called, um, there's many different uh, definitions for it, but I think the best framing came from Brooke Harrington, who told me that if there was an equals MC square of social science, it would be the fear of social death is greater than the fear of physical death. So it's SD greater than PD. And another way of looking at that would be like if you, it's your reputation or your status that you're worried about. 
And if the ship is going down, that's what you put on the lifeboat. And you'll you gladly let your mortal self your your go sink to the bottom if your reputation survives. So people can will often do things for fame or status or legacy. And via that motivation, they will destroy other parts of their lives. They're willing to sacrifice other parts of their lives. And in most extreme cases, you'll have things like anti-masking, anti-vaxxing, uh, or just war, you know, where people are willing to like the motivation to be a good member of my group to signal to other people that I am a reasonable, trustworthy individual. Uh, it seems odd. It seems odd that you would be like, well, if I die, I'm no longer a person who gets to enjoy that reputation. <laughs> but you're thinking as if we're like, you're thinking like in, in some sort of philosophical greater than an animal thing that we, it, no, no, these are algorithmic responses that are baked into the, uh, Hard, they're, the, they're not even the software. They're in the hardware of our brain. These are the results of of extreme millions of years of evolution and natural selection to guarantee that we will behave in a way that benefits the group, because we are social primates. And once you start seeing us seeing us in the frame of social primates, and not even social primates, we're ultra social primates. Um, we survive by forming and maintaining groups. We survive by pursuing group goals by deliberating in a way that we all work toward the same thing. And we are very, very aware of when somebody is um, troublesome. We're very aware when someone is uh, not pulling their weight or they're causing uh, harm or they are uh, a troublemaker in any regard. Like we're very careful of that. And one of the most important things is trust. It's very difficult to coordinate and operate in units and groups and institutions. If there's any question about the trustworthiness of individuals and the trustworthiness comes in many forms like it could be about the competency of that person within a certain context it could be about the history of their behavior in certain domains it could just be about hmm i wonder if that person's only out for themselves and they're trying to manipulate the situation you know the sort of the game of thrones things that goes on so i guess in short yeah when, when you hear that whole man as a political animal thing uh it comes down to the fact that we're all social primates and we're very careful about our reputation management. And so what is the point about this? Why is it important to know that? Uh, well, we, you may have noticed recently a lot of weird stuff when it comes to conspiracy theories and fundamentalism and polarization and extremism and uh, politics that seems to be real fringy in ways that didn't seem okay in uh, just 20, 30, 40 years ago. A lot of that comes from, if not all of it, from this propensity to to pursue belonging goals over accuracy goals. And once we were handed the internet, it's very easy to cherry pick all this information to find that which will signal to others that you're a really good member, a really trustworthy member of your group. And that fuels polarization, that fuels extremism. And I just want to underline this, David, because uh, I have listened to every one of your podcast episodes read the book a couple of times, listened to it on Audible in trying to understand a lot of this. And I want to underline knowing that many of my listeners will be nodding and agreeing with that, viewing others <laughs> yeah. as being that way, right? So it's yeah, sort you're of so like, right. Yes. Uh -huh, yes. That, they, that, so that's why they That's why do they do it. Mm -hmm. They do it rather than recognizing that this is inherent in all of us, we all prioritize belonging and therefore we all uh, face some of the same issues and challenges. So I just want to make sure that this is not people nodding and again saying, aha, mm -hmm. so that's why those people that are anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers or name it, that's why they believe the way they do, but it doesn't apply to me as much. Mm -hmm. In fact, that that very feeling you have of, uh-huh, that's what they do. That's what they do. That they that's banging around and echoing in your skull, that's the thing I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. That inability to see that you're doing that too. Um, if you've ever gotten on social media and and started to type out something and thought, mm, maybe, maybe I better not. I, who are you worried about? Like you're, you're not worried about the people in the other political party, or you're not worried about people in groups you don't belong. You're thinking about how will I be uh, questioned, shamed, ostracized, 
you're you're avoiding a certain type of humiliation, a certain type of reputation hit, and you're not avoiding it from them. You don't even care what they think. You disagree with them. You're okay with letting them know that. You're worried about us, and you want to stay us. You want to stay in us. You want to be a good member of us. So that's part of it. And a great deal from from the car you drive to the music you listen to, to the uh, the food you eat, to the shows you watch on television. Um, social social scientists can take just that information and determine who you voted for very very easily. Um, there's almost nothing that a person does behaviorally when it comes, especially when it comes to purchasing things or watching content that you can't divide away from everything else you might know about that person demographically and still very accurately determine all the other aspects of their choices because it we we tend to group up in, in, around almost everything behaviorally speaking. And yeah, that's, uh, and you have to be careful which groups you belong to. And then it's not just that, the, something else that fascinates me in that domain is as we become more secular, at least in the West, you know, as, especially the United States, there's um, a lot of fragmented. There's been a lot of like um, the the landscape of the the groups to which we belong has become very fragmented to the point that people are eager to identify, and and you know, as far as psychology is concerned, identifying your your identity is that which identifies you as a member of your group and not the other group, and you see the rise of these identities that beforehand would have just been stuff I'm into. Uh, you know, veganism is a, it's, it's fascinating that that can become an identity like, or on the other side, like I'm not a vegan becomes an identity. I, you know, like I'm going to put a bumper sticker showing me like shooting a, a, a deer and eating it. Like, see, I'm not a vegan. The, the star Wars fandom has gotten to a, a state where people can get the, they'll like uh, say, we can't be friends anymore. <laughs> Um, over the fandom that I'm in, uh, people will spend hours every day arguing on Reddit about Game of Thrones and um, the new Lord of the Rings in a way that isn't just, hmm, yes, I like this actor and this is interesting cinematography. It's it's all about identification and how does this affect me. That's another aspect of all of this, and that there are large swaths of our of our global community that have found themselves sort of like the roadrunner off the cliff with their their uh, legs you know <laughs> just just spinning in the air because they they their identity has sort of what was what would have been this the the identity that kept them going that kept you motivated that put you into a a sort of the brackets that help you make sense of your life and your and the, your the dynamics of the people around you and a lot of that has become confused and uh, epistemically chaotic and there's a scramble at play. We're just in a phase. I, I do believe we'll pass through this phase, but we're definitely in a phase where it's become very, um, there's a, a restlessness, a desperation to to discover, well, which groups do I belong to? And once I find a group that feels that I get that belonging feeling, how do I definitely stay here and not get kicked out? And that that's the on-ramp to a lot of weird things that we are are witnessing right now, in the dis both in discourse and if you have anybody in your family that's like fallen into a conspiratorial community, the word community is the is the important part of that phrase. We all entertain conspiratorial thinking. It's conspiratorial communities that are on the rise, or not necessarily on the rise, that they have more power than they have ever had to affect how people uh, manage themselves in their own, in their personal lives away from the internet, away from the library and so on. So David, uh, to that point, uh, before we get to how minds change, then how is it that we make up our minds? So you mentioned, and sure. I know you have a couple of great episodes on whether it's uh, vaccine hesitancy or other factors. How is it, how come some people make up their mind that they are more hesitant with vaccines and then get involved in that kind of community. How do sure. we make up our minds? Well, we all start out with uh, this problem solving. Uh, what's the best way for me to put this? We all start out with this pattern recognition uh, ability that brains have. Human brains are incredible at pattern recognition. And there is, whenever we're in a moment of uncertainty, we feel this dopamine rush that brings our attention to the situation so that we can try to notice the patterns within and reduce that 
feeling of surprise and the recoil we have from uncertainty and ambiguity should we be back in that situation again and so there's all this is very ne- neurological very chemical if you wanted to go up into psychological terminology i like the phrase the two words assimilation and accommodation these terms are really powerful and it's worth adding these to your vocabulary this comes out of the work of uh piaget who, uh, who has this great work called uh Genetic epistemology. I, ha- I actually have one of these old musty books over here of his of his <laughs> old works. Uh, I was just glancing at it. Um, if you remember Piaget from school, oftentimes when you learn about his work, you learn about the uh, stages of childhood development. And he was, he was bouncing out of the old uh, intelligence research that was trying to determine at what point can you start teaching children certain things. And they were noticing that there were stages of development that seemed to come online at certain age, uh, certain ages. And my favorite one is when you like, it's the thing that I still always, when I go to a bar, I always see people still getting tricked by this one where they show kids, they give kids a, um, a wide glass and then they give them a tall glass and they pour the, what's in the wide glass into the tall glass and children are like, wow, you just made more <laughs> drink. Um, but every time I see a, a cocktail delivered in a tall glass, I'm like, y'all, stages of piaget stages of development right here in this cocktail um but he 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 just he has this beautiful architecture for understanding how we update and slowly build more robust models of reality and assimilation is disambiguating if something if you encounter ambiguous uncertain information or an experience that doesn't seem to fit to what you currently under, have, have experienced but had up to, into, to, up to that point, you will either assimilate or accommodate. Assimilation is taking novel information and trying to fit it into your existing understanding. He would use the word schemas. It's easier to, to use like models of reality if you can think of it that way. So you can interpret that which was ambiguous or uncertain as confirmation of that which you already understand. The Accommodation is acknowledging that the model is incomplete or incorrect in some way, and then updating the model to accommodate. So one example I often say in this uh, domain is to imagine a child sees a dog for the first time, and you know it's like, what's that? And you say, dog, and something categorical takes place. Non-human, walks on four legs, covered in fur, no clothes, um, dog. And if they see like a, a dog of a different color, they can just very easily assimilate. Like, okay, they come in different colors now. Thanks. If they see a horse for the first time, they may attempt to assimilate by, by seeing it and saying, look, dog, big dog. And you say, no, 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 that's a horse. Well, this doesn't seem to make sense. Okay. It's non-human, walks on four legs, isn't wearing clothes, covered in fur. But okay, there are other things I need to pay attention to here. And now I must accommodate. And the accommodation is categorical as well, because if there are dogs and horses, that means there must be a greater category I wasn't aware of before in which they both fit. And we don't need to be taught that. The brain will just take care of it for us. It builds another layer of abstraction to make up for it. But you're truly accommodating the new knowledge. And now you have a new category, maybe something creature or animal or something like that, mammal, someone some adult needs to give you the word for it, or you'll make one for yourself. And we are constantly doing that. And that's how our minds are made. If you want to be like very, very, very reductive about it, because this is happening nonstop all day long, every second of our existence as children, there's so many novel ambiguous experiences and we're assimilating some and accommodating others, but it never stops. Like right now in this conversation, we're both assimilating and accommodating constantly. What happens though, is over time, that these models become extremely complex and robust. And there's a risk versus reward that enters into this. I, I, I'll, I like to think of it as a, a tightrope. Um, if you update when you shouldn't, you might become wrong, which in a previous uh, environment that from in which the brain reformed could get you eaten. It could also lead you to not ever getting <laughs> to eat again. And updating when you should, when not updating when you should could uh, cause you to remain wrong, to remain incorrect. And that could get you eaten. That could also lead you to not getting something to eat. And when I use the word wrong, that's a very suitcase word. And I, I mean, like if I pop the uh, locks on it, a bunch of stuff comes up. Wrong can mean factual, moral, political, ethical. Uh, it can mean something very empirical. It can mean something very attitude-based, value-based. But when it comes to 
what we're talking about here. If I update my model in a certain way, I could become wrong. And if I don't update it, I could stay wrong. And so you're walking that tightrope, but as your model gets more and more complex, it, it's the risk versus reward magnifies to it's probably better just to err on the side that everything I thought before I came into this new experience is still true. That's why if you like open the door to your kitchen this afternoon and there's like a bunch of uh, uh, sea slugs playing, playing uh, in a marching band, you're probably, <laughs> you're not, your first thought is that, Oh, I didn't know that could happen. You know, I wonder where these slugs came from. Maybe should I introduce myself? Like it's going to be, okay, somebody's playing a trick on me. This is a hologram. Uh, maybe I, I must have, somebody must have slipped something into my drink. You're going to try to assimilate it. You're not going to immediately accommodate. Oh, I didn't know that could happen. The, But we also see that in, uh, like I said, this is, you're erring on the side of, of, of assimilation instead of accommodation, but that's because you're just motivated not to make the mistake of and get yourself in trouble of updating when you shouldn't or or not updating when you should. There are other motivations that come into play that make this even less likely that you will accommodate. And we've spoken of some of them already. It's these it's, it could just be this might mess with my paycheck. This might mess with my chance at a at a ally or a mate or something like that. But could also be these concerns about will this make me look like an untrustworthy individual? Will this make me uh, look like someone who should be shamed or ostracized within my in-group, my affinity group. And it's in those cases that you see people really, really bend the map to try to assimilate things that are pretty obvious to people outside of the, that motivational, uh, like when people who aren't motivated in that way will be like, what's how, what? I am usually see this when it comes to false flag. Whenever someone sees an event and that event would paint their in-group in a bad light, that's when you hear that false flag uh, explanation bubble up in discourse. I, uh, not to get too deep into politics, but a great example of this is the insurrection on the January sixth. Um, people who had a whose whose political party or the people they consider within their political in group, they have these positive emotions when they think about them. They have a, they hold them in positive regard. They have a positive affect, as they would say in psychology. So they just have a positive attitude toward people in a certain political persuasion. And then they watch what happened on the on television, and they they have this other value set, which is you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't attack the capital. You shouldn't hurt people. Um, so now they have cognitive dissonance. I have a positive attitude toward my toward this particular group, and now I have a negative attitude about what they just did. So you're faced with this assimilation or accommodation um, conundrum. You could accommodate and say, "Hmm, well, I guess." Uh, maybe the group that I'm part of, I need to think about whether or not it's always good, or there are certain members of this group that are problematic. These are things you'd have to do to accommodate, or you could assimilate, which is, you could just say, didn't happen. Well, how, how could that, how could that be? Those were not members of my group. Those were paid actors. They're members of some sort of government organization. Maybe that's people from the other group pretending to be members of my group. And that's when you get the false flag thing. That's a very easy way to get out of accommodating something and changing the way you view it. You can just assimilate and say, oh, everything I thought going into this is still the same. It's just that that was a false flag and you're trying to trick me. And that's an extreme example, but we're constantly doing that. You can People do this very often in romantic relationships. I'm sure you've seen people, um, when you're on the outside of a, of a romantic dynamic and somebody does something that they clearly should be... Uh, uh, should be chided for they like or something that should have result in the end of the relationship and you see your friend forgive it in some bizarre way and go oh well you know they always you can hear them doing this we see it but we only see that on the outside on the inside you're so motivated to assimilate that it almost feels like it's it's pulled you pulling you by the nose that it's got you hooked in some way and it's true it does <laughs> so so as as people are assimilating, uh, you also uh, episode one fifty seven of your podcast. I got emotional listening to it because you have a couple of clips from jo Jonestown. I would oh, recommend wow. for everyone to uh, listen to that. Thank but you I, for mentioning that. That's my that is my the episode that I consider it's the best episode I ever did. It's about pluralistic ignorance, and yes, yeah. it has a lot of audio from Jonestown. And uh, that 
that pluralistic ignorance, uh, uh, I want to highlight it and want to get your Thank thoughts you. because the uh, it's not just an issue, again, with the others, and it's also an issue that happens uh, within organizations yes. and communities too. So would love some of your thoughts with respect to pluralistic ignorance and how we can have environments or leaders can have environments that minimize pluralistic ignorance. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. I'm, I'm um, and I'm not promoting this. I'm just giving, I'm giving a lecture to a group of uh, government officials in uh, later on a, a couple months from now. And when I was thinking to myself, like, what do I want to highlight? Because they're worried about um, institutional things. I was like, what do I want to highlight? And it was, it was I very quickly landed on pluralistic ignorance. I recently talked to Jay Van Babel, who's been on the podcast many times, and we were just talking about different things that were happening in um, in research. And we got on this topic, and uh, I, we both. I feel like it's one of those things that. This is one of the findings from psychology. Like, I'm I'm totally into confirmation bias and all the other things that, that I often talk about motivated reasoning, but pluralistic ignorance is one of those things that is. I feel like I, it's so vital that this becomes part of our common understanding of humanity, because you can do something about this. And let me explain what it is before I talk about some sort of the interventions and and um, and. Um, the uh, pr prescriptive advice, pluralist ignorance, and there's about a dozen different ways to, uh, in, in the episode, we define it like 75 times because there's so many different ways you can define <laughs> it. Uh, let me define it with an example. Uh, one of the biggest problems on college campuses, especially in the 1990s and early 2000s, was binge drinking. The drinking to, to so much excess that you are, are a danger to yourself and others and you blackout and you can die just from alcohol poisoning. But even if you don't go that far, you just become uh, a big uh, gelatinous mass of dumb that causes bad things to happen to yourself and others. Now, if you've ever drank, if you ever had that much alcohol, and I'm sure many people listening have, we all have had that experience. We were playing around in that space, especially when we're young. You don't you don't look back upon it that fondly. You you often talk about it in terms of like what an idiot I was, or thankfully you were there, or uh, I'll never do that again. Um, it's very rare that people pursue that level of intoxication every single time they drink. On if you are a new member of a college campus and you're trying to like fit in, like that's it's a bizarre situation where you're like I feel very pressured to drink to this level of excess every single time I go out every weekend, sometimes every night. So it was a big problem and campuses were all trying to figure out what to do about it. One of the things uh, that some of the researchers I talked to on that episode did when they were looking into this, um, they through a security, uh, through a, um, a very Byzantine uh, security process that I don't have to go into. They, came up with this idea of why don't we talk to people about how much they want to do this. And what they discovered in that process was almost every single person they talked to said they hated it and wished that it wasn't a thing and didn't want to do it. Yet, almost every single person that told them that did it. So this is the essence of pluralist ignorance. It is when most of the people in one group, could be an institution or a subculture, but it could be as large as a nation, all feel like their internal attitude is private to themselves and unique and part of a minority if it is like if we we're going to measure it. But the, uh, and that's because everyone is behaving as though they feel the opposite of that. So behavior is not matching people's internal attitude. But since we can't read each other's minds, the assumption is everyone else is behaving in the way that they want to. And so therefore, I am the only naysayer or I'm part of a small group of naysayers. But the truth is, no one wants to do this. No one agrees with this norm or this behavior. They're just afraid to be the only person who seems that way because that's risks, ostracism, and shame, and all the other social stuff we mentioned earlier in the conversation. That seems like, oh, okay, I can see what that could be a thing here and there. But this is there's so much research in this since the 1940s. This is probably one of the, if not the, one of the most 
like powerful forces that led to the extreme lag time between attitudes changing on segregation, attitudes changing on women's rights, attitudes changing on LGBTQ rights, attitudes changing on everything from marijuana to gun control and so on. Attitudes on these issues often will shift within the public, yet the behavior or the norm or the law will persist for a decade or so after that because the the there's something about the dynamic in the, in the social network where people cannot communicate their internal state without the fear of shame and ostracism. So one of the most powerful ways to introduce change in any one of these dynamics is to, as they say in psychology, surface the attitude, surface the norm, surface how people feel about it. And there are millions of ways to do this with, with, uh, uh, drinking with uh, with uh, binge drinking on campuses. One of the ways they they solved this, or in places that they did solve it, was just to put up signs and billboards saying mo how other people felt. <laughs> they just just telling people how other people feel. You this is also sometimes the work of like stand up comedians. Oftentimes, like their job, if they have any job socially, is to say out loud what no one else is saying out loud, and doing so at a, like as if they're going to take the hit. But when they say it out loud, if everybody laughs and we all look at each other and go, wait a second, you think that too? It's a way to bust pluralistic ignorance. There are many, many different interventions and the all of them basically use the, are doing the same thing, which is how do I get how people people's private attitudes out into the open in a way that they will feel safe to express it? Or how do I do that on their behalf and then serve as a middleman who says, hey, by the way, I spoke to everybody and this is how everybody actually feels. There are many different ways to do it. Sometimes it's done by like great movies, great television shows. Will they'll be they'll be considered subversive, but subversive in in a way that we assumed it was subversive. We all actually have no problem with it until it's on television. Um, there's only there's so many things that go into it. Now, there it gets. This is obviously very complex and very nu nuanced. In the episode, I talk about how we it's often framed incorrectly as the emperor has no clothes. Um, that isn't always the best way to bust pluralistic ignorance. And I use the Jonestown massacre as an example, because in that case, there was a naysayer um, who stood up and said, hey, we don't have to drink the poison. Um, and that person was shouted down by everyone and made to drink that poison at gunpoint. And then they drank the poison. They all you know, died along with their children. Um, yet, oddly, if we had done a poll, like most of those people didn't want to do that. But there were many that there are so many things at play at Jonestown that it couldn't just be revealed. Just the, just the revelation that people have different private attitudes wasn't enough. That's what happens when you get, that was a confluence of many things and that's a complex topic. But I guess one of the big takeaways here is you definitely don't want to let your organization get to the level of a Jonestown where there's so many levers being pulled. There's so many motivations at play that even just revealing the private attitudes won't be enough. The good news is that's rare. Um, the yeah, good it, news is you, there are many ways to uh, bust pl pluralist ignorance that uh, that don't take much effort at all, actually. Yeah, but David, you also touch on uh, different studies, including the ones at, at Cornell on wine tasting. So it uh, where people, when they were asked individually versus when they were asked in a group, they were willing to express their uh, opinions about the wines very differently. So there is an impact in uh, even the smallest environments with the uh, with issues that are not as important to us on how we respond based on our perception of what others people expect of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you very quickly in a new social environment, we will begin to modulate our responses to what we think the expectations of the people around us are going to be. We will also quickly uh, onboard into what is the status game being played around us right now? Like, what do I do that will give me more respect in this particular context than it would in another context? And what can I do to lose that respect? And you will quickly titrate and modulate your behavior to sync up with that. And then the and you're right it could be anything wine tasting it could be uh people are having a conversation about um 
the Transformers movies, people, you know, like you very quickly go, hmm, okay, I'm in a group of people where if I was to be the person that said, I don't like that, that makes me cool. But you could also be be paying close attention to go, wait, if I'm the person who says, I don't like that, I'm not cool. Same behavior, different context, different status, reward, or cost, different sanction. So we very quick, we're very quick to onboard. Um, if a group of people are onboarding simultaneously, what do you end up with? You have a lot of people pretending to act in a certain way so they can all play that game. And so that being understood, when you want to bust this up, and I mean, man, there's so many examples in this. My favorite, my favorite example of this phenomenon is uh, there was a uh, uh, a vegetarian colony, a vegan colony, a uh, commune, and uh, but uh, seventy plus percent of people were sneaking away to eat fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so what they wanted to be was a pescatarian colony, but they were afraid to be the to be found out that they wanted to do that. So, in your organization or institution, this is something you have to think about, and whether you're a business or you're part of the government. Um, one thing you have to be aware of is there is no such thing as a social vacuum. So how are you communicating the values of your company, governmental institution, whatever it is, how are you communicating the game to the people who are onboarding into your group? Because the way you communicate that will result in different types of behavior, depending on what they discover is the naughty and the nice of your group. How do I gain social reward? How do I avoid social sanction? The other thing is, how strong is the network that you've created? Have you created nodes that are in isolation? Like, do you have a department that never talks to another department? Like, ever. Like, ever, ever, ever. And are you, as the? have you created a hierarchy where only people in certain elite status uh, levels are able to, to talk across groups? Uh, you're setting yourself up for this scenario is what I'm saying. Because what you're creating are pockets of interaction that have their own cultural norms and values, and they will be more motivated by that than they will be the overarching norms and values of the organization. And when they come into contact with other pockets of the organization, they will feel a little bit of us versus them, and you're, and they won't feel sort of overarching us in that situation. The how, Do you have this ability to cross communicate with all levels of the hierarchy for that matter how hierarchy driven are you like the and I'm, this is you know old business school stuff but it's still true like a hierarchy where the that's built on um <laughs> risk <laughs> you don't want to risk making the person above you uh fire you versus one that's based off how much can i support the person beneath me because that person has contact with the thing like if you're in government, it's contact with the voter, contact with the uh, constituent. If you're a business, it's contact with the client or the customer. Well, whoever has got the whoever is the contact person, the person. I mean, that's like the cilia of your organism. That's the the that's the fingers of your of your body of your corpus. You need to be supporting that person who is above that person. Needs to be supporting that person. Because they're the one who's doing the thing that matters, the one that brings the in the money and the influence and all the other things that are important to you. A hierarchy where the person above that person is supporting that person. And by the time you get to the top, that person's job is to support everyone at the with all their might, with every molecule of their being. That's their role. There are many hierarchical structures that don't work that way. They work in a way of like, you do what I tell you. Like we're, they work like kingdoms, you know, they work that's that's that you're setting yourself up for pluralistic ignorance because everyone becomes terrified to say what they think and feel. Like that contact person probably knows what's going on and what needs to happen, what's not working. And they probably have a lot of conversations with other people at their level because those are the people that can help them. Those are those people that can communicate, that can use the private language of the thing that they're doing. And they may be very aware that man, the company wants us to do this and is the dumbest thing we could ever do. They're asking us to switch to this policy. I can't believe they're asking us. I wish they would switch to such and such policy. They probably have all of this knowledge about what to do. They probably have these very strong feelings and they're terrified to say it out loud, it, it, but they only talk about it in certain company. And I see this often, uh, the, just the little consulting that I've done with like, you can tell when this is happening, when pluralistic ignorance is, is like starting to fester. When people have meetings, 
And then they have the real meetings. <laughs> I, I bet you've done this. I've done, I remember doing this when I worked in the TV journalism. You have the board meeting or you have the meeting of like the, for me, it was the head of each department. I was the head of a department. So you have this department head meeting and we're all like, this is happening. This is happening. And okay, that's good. We're worried about this. That's great. Okay, cool. Then I'll walk away. And then like <laughs> my friend, the person I trust in that group or the people that I hang out with most, we go have the real meeting. Like, man, you won't believe what they're saying. That, that, that piece of communication is floating free from the, the play, the hierarchy of the org where it needs to be moving around and, and, and being disseminated. And why would a person do something like that? The same reason why you will like type out a tweet and delete it. The same reason we do a lot of things out of the fear of what will be the social cost for me expressing my attitude? What will be the social cost for me suggesting maybe that's not a good idea? That's the essence of of how plural ignorance can destroy an organization where everybody knows the right thing to do, but nobody's doing it. Where everyone disagrees with the policy and the norm, but no one does anything about it. It just runs on autopilot right off the cliff. And that's happened many, many times in human groups. The other thing I see in many organizations, David, that you address is minimal group paradigm mm. and how departments, divisions, groups, whatever you call it, get into a certain level of competition. And there's a lot of research with you give people different color shirts. <laughs> they start uh, treating people who are wearing the same color shirt differently. Yeah. So that is a big challenge that leaders of teams and organizations have where people are in the accounting department, some other, others are in the marketing department, sales, so on and so forth. How can that be addressed in organizations where people don't form into groups, therefore my group is better than the other group and can align and collaborate better together? Wow, this is a really, this, this is a tough one. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with the minimal group paradigm, um, there's the work of this is the work of uh, Henri Tajfeld. Um, a lot of the psychology of the like 50s and 60s and 70s was was trying to understand like how did um, World War II stuff happen? You know, how did how did large groups of people commit heinous acts? And there was a at the time the the assumption was it's probably very charismatic bad actors. Are the ones who are to blame and so Henri Tajfeld was very skeptical of all this and thought okay i'm just going to run a very like almost like physics chemistry biology kind of experiment on human behavior i'm going to get groups of people i'm going to strip away one item at a time of their like things that would identify them as being in one group or another until i get down to something that i and he called it the minimal group paradigm what is the least amount of obvious like information that I can gather just by looking at another person or maybe something I can learn about them written in a piece of paper that would cause me to start treating them as a member of a group and my behavior be affected by that. And he was like, okay, how about I just start at, at nothing and we work up from there? That was, that was his solution to how do you do an experiment like this? And uh, he found out that uh, anything Anything you add to that person that identifies them in any way will in will start to generate this sociality, this uh, tribal behavior, this us versus them thing. Um, in his experiments, he would uh, he had one run where he had people. Uh, he just showed them a, a picture of a like a abstract painter, and said, "Which one of these two do you like better?" And then they'd say, "And it's like, okay, you're a fan of so and so," and then. Anybody who said they like the other painting, they'd say, you're a fan of so-and-so. And then when they would put them into other experiments where they could divide money, they could choose who got a certain reward or, or who got favored, uh, uh, tasks of fairness, always. They'd always give more to their own group. They'd always punish the other group. If, if there's an equal time, a chance to give equal rewards, never, you know, that kind of thing. My favorite version is dots. They'd have, they'd have them um, look at a picture of dots for like, three seconds and they uh, there were 40 dots on the on the screen or on the piece of paper and they asked them to estimate how many dots did you see now he didn't actually record what people said he just randomly sorted people into either the overestimators or underestimators <laughs> and they would do the all sorts of uh things where they would show them okay hey here's another experiment you could help us with 
we had a group of overestimators spend some time with some underestimators and blah, blah, blah happened. At the end of it, they had this opportunity to give a large amount of, uh, it was a financial reward to both groups, or you could get a lesser amount, but the group that's not the one that you're in gets an even lesser amount. And people always go for this. You would rather get less if you were, were guaranteed <laughs> that they got even less. So we will choose to live in a worse off world. We'll choose a lesser world than we are living in if we're sure that still though, at the end of that, the balance is in my group's favor. And remember, the groups we're talking about that, that instigated this type of response were randomized and meaningless and arbitrary, and they just became a member of it right before the experiment. So you can imagine the difference between what if you've been a member of that group for a long time? What if your entire livelihood depends on this? What if the way people treat you in your hometown depends on this? So if we'll do it at a minimal level, imagine what happens when we had all these other extra motivations. So knowing that people will act in this way, there are things you would want to avoid in any institution. One is giving people the opportunity to make decisions in that way, like empowering people to make that kind of like choice between the in-group and the out-group needs to be, um, you need to be aware that people are going to behave in this way if you're given that choice. And anything that identifies you as a them is going to generate this. If, if you feel like this makes me an us and that makes you a them, it's going to generate this type of behavior in, in, um, in scenarios of where fairness is, is being questioned. And you might just do it a little bit, but a little bit adds up across a large organization or across a lot of decisions. So even at a very light level, it's going to put a finger on the scale of whatever you care about. Um, and also anything can become politicized once you do this. This is something that blew my mind. Um, once people are thinking in terms of us versus them, then if anything becomes a signal of us versus them, people will start acting in this very strange way. So like you, like you said, like in replications of this, they just have people wear different colored shirts or they have them different colored hats. Um, in your organization, what you need to, what I would like my major like contribution to this is the easiest thing you can do is there's no way to avoid there's let's say your, your organization has an engineer and you have an, somebody in your organization is um, they work in user interfaces. Okay. This person works in user interfaces. This person works in, in the actual hardware engineering of your or whatever you're working on. Let's say you're in government and you have someone who their job is they are in communication and this other person's uh, work is in um, research. Okay. It's very easy to have a communication department and a research department. It's very easy to have a uh, user interface department and a hardware engineering department. What happens when you do that? A little bit of us versus them is going to come in. It's, it seems crazy because aren't we all in the same company? Man, if you, I have, I come from a military family. Look, like military people still do this too. Like, uh, that guy's a tanker and I'm a, you know, a soldier. Like I know we're in this together, but also expletive, expletive, expletive. They always do this, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the ways around this is creating groups where the having, first of all, having meetings where people from different groups meet are in the meetings together, thinking about the problem as a group and also creating, um, orgs. And it's difficult to do. You create orgs where people, multiple people from different departments are working together in like not only in the same sometimes in the same room but in in um committees and things like that where people are don't feel so isolated at all times you're also creating those social bonds that are important to create the uh, cascade effects but the thing that they found in Tajfil's work is constantly communicating that we are dealing with a shared problem and we're trying to work toward a shared goal and that goal can't be the goal of, I'm sorry if you work for Microsoft or Apple, I'm going to use Microsoft. Uh, if there's somebody listening, working at Microsoft, I'm merely using this <laughs> as some sort of example. Let me change it. Uh, uh, if you're working for uh, Schmicro uh, <laughs> if, you, if you're working for uh, Super Donut Incorporated, that, that way you can find some neutral thing. And you're like, we're working together on this, on a shared goal. We, we're trying to get away from the thing that David McCraney said not to do. It. I've worked for plenty of companies that told me that we were all working toward a shared goal. 
And I knew from my desk, that goal was to make my boss rich. <laughs> that goal was to make this company uh, rise higher in the stock market. That goal was not, it wasn't my goal. That was your goal. So be careful about that. Um, how do I, what, how do I deal with that? Well, you have, you can't have just one unified goal. You need to have goals that are pertinent to that particular group of people who are working towards something. And you also have to have problems that you want to solve together. And in Tajville's um, extended work, they, they basically created Lord of the Flies. It's a long study called the Robber's Cave Experiment, where they had groups of children and they divided them into two different groups. And those two groups ended up uh, almost killing each other. Um, the way they got them out of that thinking was they the, the bus that was leaving the camp broke down and they had to all work together on the bus, right? That's not just a shared problem. That's a shared problem that directly affects those people at the level, like not at some abstract level that they, they were, they all needed to get out of the camp. And if they worked together, they got that thing. So the easiest way to bust this up is to communicate, create a, create a, a system where people can communicate freely create a system where people do feel like though we have specialities, all of us are appreciated for those specialities, not grouped by those specialities. And those specialities work in tandem. They, 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 there's, this is a, a never ending multiple, uh, multi-dimensional handshake with one another towards some sort of problem. We're all trying to solve some sort of goal. We're all trying to reach some sort of value that brought us all together in the first place. And this is going to do a lot of work toward reducing the negative impact of these things. You can never reduce it to zero where we are social primates wearing, you know, we are those bonobos, chimpanzees, us, you know, we've got, we might have suits and shoes and everything, but we're still <laughs> acting very primate ways. So I can't reduce this to zero, but we can um, get away from things like uh, the, the type of group think they'll teach, teach you in psychology where everybody at the table, like there have been moments in the history of the United States where, the decision to drop bombs, the decision to invade countries, the decision to uh, institute policies. Most of the people in the group making the decision did not want to do that. But these social dynamics led them to uh, a decision that seemed as if it was uh, unanimous when it was not unanimous. It was unanimous in its expression, but inside the, the heart and soul and brain of each person at the table, people didn't agree with what was about to happen. There are ways to mitigate that. Yeah, and that's that's really important, David, in that the awareness of it at least makes you try to address it. Huge it's inoculation, not, as they say. Huge. Yeah, it's not it's not uh, uh, realistic to totally eliminate it. However, this exists in all organizations. Now, one of the one of the uh, other important things I want to briefly touch on this because your book is about how minds change. First of all, <laughs> I love the title. Yeah. Uh, because and I know it's intentional. It's not how to change minds. All kinds of CEOs and business leaders read all kinds of books about how to change minds. Yeah. And I've gone through a journey with you, David McCraney, over the past few years. Mm. In that at first, I when I had come out of business school, I felt like with data and facts, I could overwhelm people to see things the way they are. And they were always the way I saw them, right? <laughs> so at first, that's what I felt. Then I sort of gave up in that, my God, there, there are people that just like, for whatever reason, they, they don't get it. You're not going to change their minds. And I love your optimism and the work you have done, including in studying deep canvassing, mm -hmm. in that minds do change. So... How can minds change? Sure. I, you're right. I definitely didn't want to name, I didn't want the title to be how to change uh, someone's mind or how to change minds. Uh, I had a very nice phone call with Simon Sinek. I think he's a wonderful human being. And his, hey, I took quite a bit of his advice, but one of the things he advised was like, you should change the title. It's a much more like I'd buy the book, that book more than I would the other book. He's right. It is for that purpose. It would be a better title. David, the only I, is, I have to, I have to stop you there. This is exactly what I love about you and the content that you put out. And it makes it different than a lot of content that is out there. 
in that there are times when we can do things, say things, especially in the social media age, that get a lot more traction, but are further from real value and what can totally benefit people. Anyway, I wanted I wanted to make sure I highlight that because that to me is a sign of who you are and the kind of value you share with your community. Go Thank on. you. I, I, I really appreciate that. This is a, I've made a lot of uh, decisions that would have been, <laughs> that would have pumped up the volume of my signal or <laughs> I, I just can't do it. I, and with this book in particular, it was really hard to put it together. If I wanted to write a book that was just pure persuasion, no problem. Um, but I didn't want to write How to Win Friends and Influence People Part 2. I didn't want that book. And I am personally, like, ethically, morally opposed to coercion and manipulation. And I, what I was more interested in was the resistance to change and the insistence on why don't the facts work on people, things like that. This The frustration was fascinating to me for two reasons. One, I um, I was I was giving a lecture before the book was even a real idea. And someone came up to me and she said that her father had fallen into a conspiracy theory. And at the time, I was very pessimistic. I was very cynical. I was only talking about motivated reasoning and things like that. I still saw human... Um, reasoning as being flawed and irrational, which I don't see it that way anymore. I see it as biased and lazy, which is way different. And she said, how do I get my father out of this conspiracy theory? And I just told her you can't. And I really, I felt so awful, like before, before the words even came out of my mouth all the way. And I, for one thing, I didn't know, have know enough about the topic to give this kind of advice. And for another, I didn't even believe myself. I thought there must be more to it. So that started me on the path of trying to understand this more. And the other thing was, while I was saying that the norms about um, and the attitudes about same-sex marriage in the United States were just completely flipping. Um, over the course of just a few years, it went from 60% opposed to 60% in favor. And I just couldn't get it out of my head that you could take the majority of this nation, put them in a time machine, send them back just five, seven, eight years and ask them, how do you feel about this issue if they're both standing in front of you? And they would disagree. They would argue. And I couldn't get out of my head that if this person was going to eventually feel this way, why did it take this long? What happened between here and here? And if I could understand that, I could understand, I think I could understand a better way of persuading, a better way of coming to understand things. Uh, So that's what I want to understand. How do minds change? And how do you go from seeing things in one way to seeing it another? Believing in one way, believing another, having an emotional response, and then having the opposite of that emotional response, and so on, emotional response, and so on. So, one of the things that I fell into was um, going. I thought the one of the best ways to understand this was to spend time with people who had changed their minds in drastic ways, but also spend time with people who changed minds in drastic ways. And I had no idea there were such groups, but there are many. They are all in the book, uh, deep canvassing, street epistemology, smart politics, and then therapeutic, uh, and, and also in therapeutic models that have uh, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavior therapy, and so on. And the deep canvassing was the, my entrance into this world, my entree into this world. They, um, the thing I think, but I want to mention all of them at once just to say what blew my mind and still to this day blows my mind is all these groups that I visited in person and learned their technique techniques from they were not aware of each other. And if they were very advanced in their techniques, they oftentimes had never looked at the literature that supported it, the scientific evidence that's, that either was sim- had similar practices or there were things in therapeutic models that were similar. It was astonishing that in each of these isolated silos, in intense A-B testing had resulted in a technique that was similar to where it occurred in another silo. And that seemed important because I kept thinking about like, if you were to invent the airplane, it wouldn't matter where you invented it on the planet. It's going to look like an airplane because it needs to fly. It needs to follow the laws of physics. It needs to work with gravity and so on and gravity and, and wind resistance and uh, lift and, and um, you know, Bern- physics, Bernoulli things. So that means that if this, these techniques were invented in isolation away from each other, yet they all seem to follow the same 
uh, order of operations and also say, don't ever do this, but always do that in the same way. It feels like this is on to something that is important. And then if I can talk in the book, I, I take, I'll wait all the way till page 200 before I get into this stuff, because I want you, the reader to understand that the neuroscience and, and the psychology and the sociology and the political science that, that is the foundation of why this works. And I could have done it the other way around, but I wanted it to do it that way. However, I do introduce deep canvassing up front because uh, full transparency, I did want you to go, huh? And then read the whole, <laughs> read the whole book. <laughs> so here's how deep, here's how all this works together. Um, deep canvassing is a technique by which uh, that was developed by the LGBT center of Los Angeles through the leadership lab. The leadership lab is their political action arm. And um, what makes the LGBT center of Los Angeles so unique is they're, they have, they're incredibly well-funded, millions and millions of dollars, and they can do the kind of work that you couldn't do in a lab um, or that other organizations could not do at their scale. And they had dealt with, they've been dealing with the crushing blow of Prop 8 when um, same-sex marriage went up for the vote and they lost the vote and they were astonished. How could this happen in California? How could this happen in Los Angeles and San Francisco? So this uh, LGBT organization the LAB's part of this organization, which stands for Learn, Act, Build, they uh, were headed up by a man named Dave Fleischer. And Dave Fleischer said, what if we just go ask people why they voted the way they voted, which was a bonkers idea at the time, because it required lots of like logistics. And so they set up these squads of like 40 to 75 people at a time, and they just knocked on doors and sort of did an inverted version of canvassing, where they knocked on the door and said, Hi, I'm here to ask you why you voted this way. <laughs> and then what they were, what blew their mind though, was they, people really wanted to tell you, they really wanted to tell you why they voted the way they voted. And so they did that for a very long time. They recorded lots of answers. And there's one aspect of the story, which I tell in the book about what they discovered from the, uh, the way the answers and what they were getting over time and what they figured out about certain attack ads. But the other thing they discovered was Every once in a while, when a person told them why they voted the way they voted, by the end of the conversation, they would talk themselves out of their position. And they were like, what's going on there? That's new. And so they started recording the conversations, first on audio, then on video. And by the time I met with them, they had recorded 17,000 conversations. And I'm, they didn't just throw them onto a hard drive. They're searchable. They were labeled. And I spent hours in those archives watching these things. And I specifically wanted to look at the conversations that were in which people had changed their minds. And it was true. You could run the thing back to the beginning and they're like, here's how I feel about this issue. And then you run it to the end and they're telling you they feel the other way about the issue. And when I, I had the same feeling, if that person was to go back in time and talk to themselves from 20 minutes ago, they would argue with themselves. So What's going on in the middle between these two things? And also, I love, by the way, when people do change their minds in that way and you start asking them, well, what about this? They'll start uh, getting angry with you as if, <laughs> as if you haven't been listening to them the whole time. Like they don't, so oftentimes they don't realize that they've done it. They don't realize they've talked themselves out of their position. So here's what, over lots of A-B testing, doing trying to replicate this, throwing away what doesn't work, keeping what does. They landed on this. And this is a technique that works across a lot. I, I can I can tell you a similar story about street epistemology. They did something very similar there. And for the sake of time and for people who are like, yeah, yeah, get to it. Well, how do you do it? Um, you only need these two steps. I'll tell you all the steps, but these are the only two you actually need if you want to get this started today. Um, step one is build rapport. Um, you need to, at the level of the social primate, communicate that you are not out to shame or ostracize that person, nor are you there to put them into a position where should they leave this conversation, they will be shamed and ostracized by the groups to which they feel allegiance. You are communicating, I am interested in how you feel about the issue and I want to understand how you feel about this issue. And I would like to offer you the opportunity to, I'm going to hold space. We can explore it together. You'll notice this is a different framing from I'm right and you're wrong, or I want to change your mind, or I want to win this argument and I want you to lose the argument. If you even want to say anything about how you feel about it, which you you could just go so far as to say, you know, it's interesting. I find you a, a, a rational, intelligent, reasonable human being. And it's odd that we both are looking at this and seeing it differently. 
I'm curious as to how that could be so. And I wonder if you don't mind, I'd love to have a conversation with you and explore a little more deeply to understand. I wonder why we disagree about it. I'm curious as to why we would disagree. Completely different framing from the debate frame. Then the, to get into it, what you want to do is you want to encourage metacognition and introspection. And if it was, it's going to be nuanced depending on what we're talking about. If it's attitude based, excuse me. If it's attitude based, if it's attitude based or fact based, it changes how you talk about it. If it's a fact based or evidence based issue, you want to investigate the person's confidence or their certainty. If it's an attitude based issue, you just want to feel how positive or negative they are on a certain scale for, on this particular issue. So if it was gun control, you would you want to say it's from like zero to ten or one to one hundred. So on gun control, you could frame it as, let's say, you need to identify what the zero to ten is. Let's say on gun control, you're, if you're zero, you think uh, merely looking at a gun as a t gets you ten years in prison. And if you're a ten on gun control, um, you think that everybody should get a gun in the mail once a week. Um, you know, or you could also flip that depending on. Doesn't matter. Just make sure you put something on the numbers. And then say, where is where are you on that scale? If you're doing it with certainty, you could say, is the earth flat or round? And the and the person has to make a claim in that regard. And they say, I think it's flat. And you say, okay, well, how certain are you of that? Like on a scale from zero to 10. And if you're just talking about like a movie, like how much did you enjoy uh, um, Mad Max Fury Road? Like, you know, you could if you open with, did you enjoy it? They might say, I loved it. Okay, okay, well, what would you give it on a scale from zero to 10? And this is that moment. So in all these instances, you just change it depending on the type of mental construct we're working on. There's usually a moment where a person goes, well, hmm, or they go, mm, uh, well, th that thing that people do is that that hesitation, that hedging, that's a person slipping into metacognition. And it's kind of amazing. Like you can do it to yourself. If you're listening to this right now, let me ask you like, uh, do you like pumpkin pie? And then you're probably very easy for you to, to go, I love it. Or I hate it. And I, but if I ask you, well, what would you give it on a scale from zero to 10? You can feel the difference in, in what's going on inside of you. You go, hmm, well, if I gave it from zero to 10, I guess I'd give pumpkin pie a seven, seven. I'm going to give it a seven. This is your, you have done this. This is, this is amazing power of both street epistemology and deep canvassing and smart politics and others and motivational interviewing. Stay in that space. That's the space where change takes place. Because the next thing you're going to ask the person to do is, is produce reasons, justifications. Why a seven? Why did you give it a seven? And if you want to get even deeper, say, how come you didn't give it an eight? Why didn't you give it a nine? And if you happen to have an opinion that you're hoping the other person moves toward, you ask them why they didn't go closer to the extreme. And they will produce arguments in favor of why you wouldn't go that way. And oftentimes what happens is, this is these are new counter arguments they've never considered before, but they're the author of those arguments and they start moving away from the position they were already in. That's the essence of it. You only need those two steps. And if you want to go deeper into it, I go into it in the book, but you can um, ask a person once they've given you justifications to um, explain what, by what method have they, have they arrived at that level of certainty? How did they vet that method and so on? But they all use pretty much that. And it's all about guided metacognition. Now, I ask people to, to have a step zero. And that is uh, to ask yourself why you're doing this. That's the step zero. Um, why would you want to change somebody's mind about this particular topic? Oftentimes, people haven't considered that. And I would ask you to really deeply Socratic method yourself in that regard, because um, I'm not saying you have bad reasons to want to change somebody's mind about something. But I would ask you to understand what is your specific motivation, because the, when you discover that you can start there, which is like if you, my own father had a, had had some strange conspiracy theory got into his politics, and on the surface it felt like I wanted him to change his mind because he was wrong. But when I deeply introspected and did the Socratic method on myself, what I discovered was. I didn't want him to be in the them and me be in the us in that dynamic. I wanted to, I didn't want to ruin our relationship. I I, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to be able to discuss that issue and not worry about it. That was the real motivation. And you know what I did? I just told him that. I just said out loud, you know, I, I want us to be able to talk about this. I, want to, I don't want to lose this relationship. It matters to me. Um, I'm only, I, and honestly, at the end of the day, I'm just worried that 
you're being misled. And, you know, there's, and, and when I said that, he's like, well, I love you. I don't want to live in the And to say that we started from there, it was much more likely that I could go through those steps. Um, I could go on to this forever, but I, what I deeply recommend is before you start any of these techniques, do what my friend Will Store said. It's a great takeaway. Um, that step zero is sometimes really hard and it's very hard to Socratic method yourself. So here's a, here's a fast track to doing that. Whatever the topic is. Now, if, since we're talking about, since this podcast deals a lot with business and institutions and groups like that, we can get very specific. It could be some policy that you're talking about this week. Um, if it's politics, it could be something very broad. Uh, if it's something that's happening in the zeitgeist, it could be something very specific that's being argued about. Whatever it is, ask yourself, regarding that issue, do you think you're right about everything? <laughs> And, <laughs> or if this is your first time to ever do this kind of thing, just ask that question in general. Do you think you're right about everything? Okay. If your answer is yes, well, um, <laughs> we have a different well, book and podcast for you. <laughs> well, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> but let's say you say, well, no, I can't be right about everything. I must be wrong about some things. At the, at the minimum, I must be incorrect about some things. Okay. Then ask yourself, well, what are you wrong about? And if your answer is, I don't know, which it must be, because if you knew what you were wrong about, you'd stop being a wrong about it, right? So that's step one. Am I right about everything? If the answer is no, ask, what am I wrong about? And if the answer is, I don't know, ask yourself, why don't you know? And what could you do about that? This is the exercise that I recommend. This is like one of the biggest takeaways if you are not so smart. Start there and you'll land in the very middle of some delicious, beautiful, all-encompassing, uh, epistemic and cognitive humility. Um, and then when you approach the other person, offer them that same thing, right? They likely also don't know what they're wrong about either. And on this particular topic, what you can offer each other is the shared, your shared perspectives. There are some things that you've seen they haven't. There's some life experiences you've had they haven't. They have concerns that you would never even imagine being concerned about. And at the end of the, what, what you end up with is we don't have to try to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. We can now work together to try to understand why do we disagree? And maybe it's true that we're both wrong. Maybe there are some places where we're both right and we can gain from this interaction instead of trying to leave it in some sort of zero sum space where one of us has to walk away going, ha ha, you were stupid and now I've shown that you're stupid. It's very likely that neither one of you has the big picture and both of you can borrow from each other to get a little bit more of it than what you have walking in. What a beautiful challenge to everyone, David. And I'm sure the audience will want to become more familiar both by reading your book, following your podcast and your work. For someone who has followed your work, one of the things that adds a lot more value to your statements to me is that you have also done that with humility, changing your own mind and your own approach as you have learned more. So this is not just your thoughts and perspectives as advice for others. It's something you do yourself with that uh, empathetic, non-judgmental listening and asking that first question, which is why do I even want to change this person, person's mind? Really powerful, impactful. And then the humility with which it requires us to challenge our own thinking. If I'm not right on everything and none of us are, mm -hmm. then what am I wrong about? So maybe how minds change, we should first and foremost start with ourselves. As I mentioned, David McCraney, I can spend hours talking to you. <laughs> yes, I, I can spend hours answering a question. The, <laughs> yes. the, the, the audience uh, is going to want to read your book, follow your podcast, how best can the audience find out more about you, David? Okay. There's two ways. Like you, all my You Are Not So Smart stuff just is under youarenotsosmart.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, not smart blog, that sort of thing. Uh, the podcast name is You Are Not So Smart. Uh, and then all the other things I'm doing, you go to davidmcraney.com to find out what those are. And on Twitter, I'm just at David McCraney. That's outstanding. And uh, you mentioned, why do you want to change a person's mind? One of the uh, stories that really touched me is 
your conversation at the tech conference oh, yeah. on changing minds. Would love for you to share that. Sure. Because I think it's important for us when we think about changing people's minds, there is almost a level of, for lack of a better way of putting it, dominance to, mm -hmm. I want to change people's minds. I want to correct the way people are thinking. So for you, it's how minds change. A lot of it has to do with us and the work we do on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And why do we want to change people's minds? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you may have to edit this. Uh, I promised the person in that chapter that, that I wouldn't repeat their story. They, they, they consider it a very sacred story and they don't want me to repeat it for on their behalf, but I was allowed to do it in the book. But I can give you an overview, which is by the end of the book, I felt like I had almost had a superpower I, I in a way that I'd always wanted, which was I could on issues of morality, issues of scientific evidence, issues of politics. I felt like I had this ability to encourage other people to question themselves. And, and if they were really dogmatic or they had something very strong that I felt was empirically incorrect, I could loosen that up. And in the beginning, you know, there's no, there's no zealot, zealot like a convert. And I, I, I was eager to use it. I was invited to this conference where I was uh, given an opportunity to um, demonstrate this. Somebody there wanted me to demonstrate it on them. And um, I promised them that I wouldn't repeat the story. If you want to listen to the full story, you'll have to get the book. But I can tell you that in essence, this was their origin story of how they arrived at their faith. And I listened to the story and was so intensely moved by how they had arrived at their faith. It didn't matter to me that I didn't share their faith. I actually gained something from that story that was unique and helped me feel closer to my humanity and to them. And I could not think of any good it would put into the world to, to, to try to like get that person to eject from their faith. I also couldn't think of any poison that I was taking out of the world. I couldn't think of any harm that I was reducing. And I do, you know, advocate like, like a lot when I talk about non-judgmental listening, I talk about trying to share perspectives. Look, I understand there are people who want to put harm in the world. There are people who want to harm you. And if you don't want to offer them that space, Hey, I am not saying there's anything wrong with that. Like pick and choose your battles for sure. I do say that if you want to change minds, you will have to engage with, with people in this way. And I have met people who have been absolutely on the end of prejudice. I have pe I've met people who um, have reached out to people who are heinous and have wanted to cause them harm and I've watched them change their minds. So it is possible, but I do not ask anybody to do that just because, and I don't want you to feel like you are um, lesser than if you, if you don't feel like you want to offer that olive branch. I get that 100%. But I'll also say there's another side of that, which is, I have been in situations where this one in particular, I talk in the book where um, a previous version of myself would have cackled and loved to have messed with this person's belief system. And after, after visiting Westboro Baptist church, after spending time with conspiracy theory communities and um, have, after spending so much time with people who like have experienced post-traumatic growth and um, just running the gamut of humanity with this book at that moment, I could not think of any good reason to, to shake this person up in any way. And I actually felt like I had gained, I was going to leave that conversation with something incredible. And I just said, you know, we're done here. So in the end, like he changed me more than I could ever possibly change him. And we hugged and, and I tell in the book, you know, this ended up with a group hug and um, it was one of the most powerful moments of my life. And I do, I do draw from that still daily. Um, ask yourself why you want to do this. And um if you're not taking harm out of the world, you're not putting good into it. If this conversation is all about just going to, it's going to make you feel super smarty pants. Uh, please question your motivations. And that's a powerful, not just story, David, but a powerful example of you living with your deep values, which is what I really appreciate mm -hmm. with the content you put out. Thank you so much for this conversation, for partnering leadership, David McCraney. Thank you so much for having me. You're the best. Thank you so much. <laughs>